Hi everyone, uh, welcome to Notes from the Field, a discussion with the Kubert end users. I'm Alona Paz, I'm a principal software engineer at Red Hat, I'm part of the Kubert networking team and uh, a maintainer at Red Hat. Uh, so before we start, I want uh, to ask the audience a, a small question. Uh, can any of you that uh, heard about Kubert in the past uh, raise their hand? Okay, makes sense, you're here. Mm -hmm. And uh, can the ones that actually used it raise their hand? Okay, nice, nice. Uh, so I'll briefly present what is Kubert and then we'll go uh, to the panelists. Uh, so Kubert is an add-on to Kubernetes. It extends Kubernetes with resource types for uh, virtual machines. It enables running virtual machines alongside pods in a Kubernetes cluster. Actually, the pod is having the virtual machine inside it, and the virtual machine is connected to the pod networking. So the virtual machine is connected uh, to the pod networking. So the virtual machine has communication to the cluster network. Any component in the cluster can communicate with the virtual machine, and the virtual machine can communicate with any component in the cluster that uh, is communicating with the, the cluster network. Managing the virtual machines is done uh, using the uh, same standard tools that uh, Kubernetes has, like uh, kubectl. Uh, so let's go uh, to our panelists. Uh, can you please uh, present yourself? Uh, where are you working? For what company? What is your role in the company? And uh, what your company is doing? So I'm Ryan Hallisey. I'm a software engineer at NVIDIA. And for, I'm sure everyone knows what NVIDIA is here, but if you don't, uh, NVIDIA makes GPUs, provides various services around those GPUs. And so I specifically work on uh, a product called GeForce Now, and GeForce Now is a cloud gaming service. And so if you, uh, the way to think about it is if you ever wanted to get access to like a 3080 and you wanted to stream a game on it uh, over Wi-Fi on any device, anywhere, you could do that uh, using GeForce Now. And so sp specifically I work on the infrastructure as uh, part of uh, GeForce Now. Hi, good morning. My name is Dinesh Madraka. I am CTO at Sivo. Uh, we're a cloud native service provider who are providing Kubernetes clusters in infrastructure that we manage around the world, uh, focused on deliver de developer experience uh, being really, really simple, cost effective, and kind of reimagining how cloud computing is being provided today. Yes, hi, my name is Kim. I'm the founder of Killer Quota. We are a very recent startup. We only exist since one and a half years. And we provide sandbox environments. So you can just imagine it. You open your browser, you get direct access to a Linux VM, you get direct access to a running Kubernetes cluster. And from there on, you can use it as a sandbox environment. You can use it to show users your tools. We, for example, have a lot of CNCF projects uh, running that you can just test out in your browser. And yeah, we do this. Oh, now you can hear me properly, right? Uh, and yeah, uh, we do this um, using kubeviert, running under the hood. That's why I'm here today. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, Peter uh, from CoreWave uh, couldn't join. And uh, we also have uh, Howard from ARM uh, that couldn't join as well. But uh, since NVIDIA are uh, end users of ARM and uh, they uh, collaborate uh, together, uh, Ryan will try uh, to represent them. Sure. So. Uh, Howard Zhang was the, the engineer that was going to be represented here. So Howard Zhang is a senior software engineer at ARM. And ARM, I'm sure many people also know what, what ARM is. But if you don't, it's a, it's a CPU architecture. And uh, if you, everyone here has probably come across an ARM machine somewhere or another. You probably have one in your pocket right now. Or it's the, your cell phone. Most cell phones use ARM cores. And if you're in that 5% that don't, you probably have a Raspberry Pi. And that's, gonna, that's an ARM core. So um, uh, Howard's been working for probably about the last two years or so on Qbert to add support uh, for the ARM architecture in Qbert releases. And for about the last six months or so, uh, NVIDIA's been collaborating with ARM to actually make it a fully supported architecture as part of Qbert releases. Thanks. Thanks for presenting him. Uh, so all of you are our uh, end users. We know uh, you chose Qbert. Uh, we are uh, really cur uh, curious to know uh, why did you choose a uh, Qbert over uh, other uh, virtualization solutions? Uh, so uh, at NVIDIA, uh, we like for uh, for GeForce now, we like virtual machines. We've 
uh, for a long time we've we've um, had our infrastructure our, our first generation infrastructure used a lot of virtual machines and uh, we like them and so we wanted to move to the the kubernetes world where we can get microservices we can get containers and get the orchestration as part of kubernetes but we still wanted to hold on to the investment of using virtual machines and so for us, it made a lot of sense um, to look at Qvert. Um, Qvert provides uh, a way for us to onboard our virtual machines and run them in a Kubernetes cluster. And, and so specifically like our use cases, we want to provide the GPUs, we, we, um, we provide them, we lease them to our, to our customers, to our end users. And so we want to take, um, we want to launch virtual machines, we want to attach them to those, those guests and then we want to make them available to, uh, to our end users. And so we do this with, with Kubernetes and, and Qvert. Okay, uh, but I know uh, GPUs uh, pass through can be done uh, to pods as well. So why virtual machines? Sure. So uh, there's a lot of reasons, and um, I think the one of the the ones we say most commonly is like we, we like the security layer. We like having a kernel that sits sits between us, our control plane, and and, and the end user. And you can imagine with um, you know we're, we're providing a service, we're releasing a GPU to play a game, and, and we don't trust the end user. And so we want to have that kernel layer there. It helps us, it, it, it's more for compliance and a lot of other reasons and it helps us sleep at night so I don't get paid to wake up with someone taking over our, our entire data center. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, yeah, so at Sivo, we're providing end users with virtual machines themselves. So that's the product that we're selling. Um, we did have other technologies before we started moving over to Kubernetes, but when we did that and the main move for moving over to kubernetes was again making sure engineers were sleeping at night because the kind of the power kubernetes gives you with the auto healing and workload placement means that we're getting less pages but we still don't trust end users i mean i can see all of you here and i'm not sure how many of you i trust with root access to any of our clusters so the virtualization layer that, that kubevert provides via libvert has been you know thoroughly tested for years and years and years so the ability to leverage that security isolation, the ability to run any kernel by you as an end user, and also give our engineers more sleep at night. I think Kubevert was a great choice for that. Thank you. Yeah, if I understand correctly, like most of our use case are people that uh, have Kubernetes and uh, have pods and also need uh, virtual machines, uh, so they choose Kubevert. But in your uh, use case, uh, I understand that you chose Kubevert and got Kubernetes uh, with it. Uh, how come? Yeah, I think that's a, it's another way of looking at it that, yeah, Kubevert provided that and Kubernetes maybe was a nice add-on on the side that provided some nice features. Yes, kind of similar here. Um, there was already a lot of um, Kubernetes knowledge uh, where we came from. And then we were looking how can we maybe use this um, to provide also isolated environments. Same thing. We don't want to trust our users. They should have access to completely isolated VMs and not containers where there is direct uh, kernel access. So that was one thing. The other thing was Kubernetes. So with Kubernetes, we can now create VMs through the Kubernetes API. So we have, for example, Golang applications, and we can simply use the Golang client library to create virtual machines. And this one is really well maintained. And so that's really cool from the, from the software development um, perspective. And then one thing is also that we can kind of simply run multi-cloud. So we run on GKE, Managed Kubernetes clusters, um, where we enable nested virtualization so that we can create more multiple virtual machines per host using KubeVirt. And we also run on uh, dedicated servers, which are not that scalable, but um, much cheaper. So that were the, the main reasons. We were also looking at Firecracker at the time. I was looking at it. Um, but there, the whole aspect of the um, yeah, integration in the Kubernetes uh, world was not available, so. Thank you. Uh, we would really like to know uh, how do you use Kubevert? I mean, uh, what scale do you have? Uh, how many clusters? How many VMs in a cluster? What features do you use? Uh, how do you deploy Kubevert? Uh, you build it from scratch or uh, you use uh, one of our operators, say uh, hyperconverged operator or a uh, Kubevert operator? Uh, did you have to customize uh, Kubert for your uh, special use case or you just uh, took it as is and uh, it wasn't up? Or any other uh, interesting information about uh, your uh, specific use case? Our cluster sizes, um, they vary a little bit in our, in our production data centers. Um, we, we're in the hundreds of nodes, many hundreds of nodes, like about 500 up to 
over a thousand. Uh, our our VM our total VM count can also vary based on the node size, um, because obviously we know we, we the nodes only get so many GPUs. So we um, that can vary from also a few hundred to um, up to about two thousand. And then in addition to that, we have a lot of pods. Um, so our kind of overall size will go from in the largest zones, and it'll be um, you know maybe two thousand pods and or sorry, excuse me, ten thousand two thousand VMIs, two thousand VMs and ten thousand pods. Uh, we we uh, deploy a vanilla um, Kubernetes. We don't have any fork. And for Qvert, um, uh, we just deploy it and manage it ourselves using um, the existing tools like Vert Operator um, to roll out and, and deploy and, and upgrade. Uh, we do have a fork of Qvert. Um, we're based on um, Qvert 050. And we're actually in the process right now in our, in our zones. We run um, Kubernetes 123 in most of our zones, and we're moving our way to 126, and then we're moving from 050 to 059 for Qvert. Thank you. I think we're in a very similar situation uh, with at least how we deploy it. Uh, we use the Qvert operator to deploy. Uh, we roll that out actually using Argo across all of our regions. So we're managing Kubevert currently in five different data centers. Um, we try and cookie cutter them as well so that they're all the same. Um, and we do have a custom uh, build of Kubevert that we run internally just for some of the strange storage requirements that that we have that realistically we do need to commit back upstream but it's it's for us it's getting the time to do that because we want to give back good quality tested code back to the the project and while the test coverage is good i don't think it's good enough for the project because uh, kubevert has got some really really good test coverage and we're really really confident pulling the upstream images images down so we don't want to provide less than we're getting from the project um, in terms of density um, I think we're running between 60 and 100 VMs per compute host. Um, we have changed out of the defaults of that. I think there's the 210 pod limit. So we've gone outside of that so we can run up to 400 pods on each of these compute hosts as well for additional services around the side. Thank you, Kim. Yes, yeah, so we also use the KubeVirt operator to um, run uh, KubeVirt. And we have right now eight Kubernetes clusters in three different regions. Um, and we are kind of on the lower end. So we maybe have at most 500 VMs across all running at the same time because our VMs are not long running, right? Our VMs run at most maybe four hours and then they're gone again. So these are like disposable sandbox environments. So that's why we don't have many VMs at the same time, but we have a lot of cycling. So we always have creating and deleting um, of VMs and we also want to do this fast. Everything has to be fast. No one wants to wait. And this is why we also have a customization um, when it comes to the storage handling of Kubeweird. So there is the CDI, the, um, what is the CDI called again? Yes, correct. Container device importer, right? Interface. Interface. Yeah, maybe it's something else. Um, I mean, you can use the CDI containerize with Kubeweird. Containerized uh, data importer. Yeah, con yeah, containerized data importer. Thanks. And you can actually use it in uh, combination with Kubeweird to um, provide the images on volumes, which is really comfortable and which works really good. But we actually moved completely away from this um, just for speed. We have a local image cache on each host and we actually modified the Weird launcher to load the images directly from there for speed. So that's like one one thing that we did for our use case. Yeah, it, at, uh, for infrastructure for GeForce Now is actually really similar. Can we, we use local storage to cache our images? Our use case is also very similar in the way that we lease machines. And so like you can imagine, we only give people a certain amount of time to play games. So it's you have a, a workload that's running for whatever, it, you could say six, eight hours, whatever it is. And, and then eventually it disappears. And so you can get, you can imagine there's a lot of churn, right? You get times or period or periods of time where people are like, oh, I really want to play games. You know, it's midnight and, you know, it's, it's this is my time to play. So I, uh, we get a lot of people, you know, who show up at midnight and want to play games. But then at like four in the morning, seven in the morning, it's time to go to work. So uh, we don't get a lot of people playing games, for example. So we get this, this constant churn where we see lots of um, inflows of uh, traffic during periods of time, lots of pressure on our zones and then, times we have it off, but our, our workloads are very similar where we get this uh, this constant churn and uh, VMs moving in and out of the data center. I uh, think Ryan, uh, can you please answer for uh, ARM? Yeah, sure. So um, 
so arms uh, arms got a, a really interesting use case um, for Qvert. Um, they um, so arms uh, is a CPU architecture, right? So they they need to test against uh, a lot of different operating systems and kernels. So the way that ARM does, uh, the way, way how to explain ARM is, is doing this is they um, they use Kubernetes for their orchestration, and they use Qvert to actually spawn a bunch of virtual machines to test against uh, you know launch a different OSs and different kernels on ARM cores to, to validate them and, and test them. So they, they use it for their their test framework. Uh, thank you. I was just going to add that um, obviously the two use cases here are for more short running VMs and short running workload, but Kubevert is still able to run more wrong, long running workload. So we actually have some VMs in our infrastructure that while have been rebooted and moved around uh, kind of two years old, the original volumes that are there, customers have been putting OS updates or whatever they need to be doing on that. But the actual underlying PVC is, is two years old and it's been rolling through our infrastructure. It's been going through Kubevert upgrades and Kubernetes upgrades as we've been upgrading our infrastructure and um, customers have been really, really happy that everything has been been stable. Thanks, Dinesh. It's uh, really great uh, to hear uh, your experience. And did any of you had uh, the opportunity to contribute to Kubert? It may be a code contribution, of course, but uh, not just. Uh, we as a community uh, really want to highlight the importance of uh, non-code contributions. Uh, it may be updating docs or uh, even reviewing PRs. We have uh, release notes uh, on our PRs and uh, the users uh, may know better than us if the release note uh, is clear or not. Uh, it may be hosting meetings, uh, open issues, uh, bugs, uh, uh, answer uh, to questions uh, in the different uh, channels, mailing list uh, on Slack or uh, any other contribution. So any of you happen uh, to contribute something? So I think we um, we were working quite closely during the release of hot plug volume attachments, which I think was about a year and a half ago. Um, so hot plug volume attachments is where the running virtual machine is able to have effectively a USB stick plugged in and out of it um, while the pod is still running. Um, so the way that works under the hood is a, a separate pod is started that is co-located with the running VM that updates the mount points on the underlying compute host and that's bind mounted directly into the running VM and then some libvert magic so that it appears as a, as a disk inside there. Um, for us, that was a really, really important feature and uh, we worked closely with, uh, I think it's Alexander Wells in the Red Hat community for that to get that tested, get that pushed through and we got some really, really good feedback on the Slack from, from, from Alexander um, to get that tested, get our feedback into it and it was a really, it was a really nice experience working closely with the maintainers. Uh, thanks for this uh, contribution. Anybody else? Yes, so we don't have any direct like code contributions, but we are linked in the Kubeweird documentary at some places. Um, so I worked with the Kubeweird team together to kind of um, provide like an interactive display of Kubeweird. So you can actually go to killercoder.com slash Kubeweird and try out Kubeweird in the browser, which is kind of cool because killercoder runs on Kubeweird, but you can then also try out Kubeweird. So it's kind of like a sandwich. Cool. <laughs> Uh, so uh, Nvidia, we've uh, we made uh, a few contributions in the community, and we've we've had a really good experience. Um, uh, I've I've maintained a few pieces of the code base, um, so I'm actually one of the the Kubert maintainers, and um, I so a few different areas that I've contributed to. Like um, you know, we care a lot about uh, scale and performance, and probably these guys do too. And so we, um, uh, being that we're a large end user, um, this has been a particular interest of mine. And so we actually run a, we have a six scale group that we run, we meet weekly and we talk about how we can improve and maintain performance and scale at NQvert. Um, so it's been a, a big area of focus um, for me. And then we've, I've also um, had a lot of good collaborations with, um, so I, we've contributed VSOC into the community. We've worked with, collaborated with Google um, on actually building VSOC. Uh, we have um, also worked with um, with Red Hat. We collaborated on actually a new API that's in Qvert uh, that was released. I think it was in zero five zero as an alpha. Uh, it's called Virtual Machine Pools. Um, something that we really are excited uh, about consuming. And um, think about it as like you know in AWS you have um, auto scaling groups, um, kind of a, an idea like that. And um, 
you might also be thinking um, uh, like, okay, this maybe sounds like um, a few other components in our APIs in Kubernetes, and Kubernetes, and you'd be right. It actually, it's inspired by a few things like stateful sets and replica sets and deployments. And kind of we took little pieces of that and we made it into something that's specific to virtual machines. So the kind of the one liner of what VM pools is, it's like, it's a way for you to, uh, to manage a large number of similar virtual machines that are pets. So. Um, that's that's how we um, that's one of the uh, useful case for us since that's how we um, you know want to manage our workload. Thank you. Uh, did any of you migrate to Kubert uh, from another uh, virtualization platform? Uh, if so, uh, from what and uh, why did you choose uh, to move to Kubert and uh, how did you do it? Uh, did you build uh, the new cluster uh, from scratch or uh, maybe use uh, some tool uh, to do the migration? And uh, what can others that maybe want uh, to do it uh, can learn uh, from your experience and maybe the difficulties uh, that uh, you had? Sure, so uh, our original um, the first generation architecture, like I mentioned, is, uh, was, was heavily VM-based. It was exclusively VM-based. And um, so for us, it was it, it, when we were you know, looking around and we saw Kubernetes and um, and the idea of the shift for to, towards containers and, and microservice model. There's a lot of appealing things about it. And so um, what was important though, like, like I mentioned earlier, is maintaining that investment. Like we, we really like VMs. And so we really want to maintain that, that investment. And, but maybe we'll consider you know, moving towards um, a container-based approach at some point. So for, for us, um, we, we looked at this and it made a lot of sense to, to take our existing investment and actually move towards this new technology that we like. And, and Qvert sort of provided that, um, that uh, opportunity for us to continue using virtual machines while also entering the Kubernetes ecosystem. And, and then slowly, you know, we build more pods, microservices, and, and eventually kind of try and make our way towards um, you know, more cloud native approach. Great. Uh, so we actually started about now six years ago with an OpenStack deployment. It was the first uh, way that we were deploying virtual machines and giving our customers access to that. Um, we didn't really migrate a huge amount of those VMs over to KubeVirt. Um, a lot of them we were able to, to build net new, um, which was really, really handy. Um, but a few of the kind of long-running customers that we had uh, we we did a really boring project with them where we provisioned a new VM and R synced some data over and restarted some services. So, luckily, it was it was small enough and a, a really good technical customer set that allowed us to, to migrate over. Um, there was some marketing and messaging around it's more secure and and wouldn't it be great rather than us having to work out how to get OpenStack style images over into Kubevert. I'm pretty sure it's possible, but it didn't feel like the engineering time was going to be well spent versus R sync. Yeah, so we didn't have to migrate from some place. I mean, we just started development like two years ago. And so we only had the fun time of uh, weren't able to use KubeVirt directly from scratch. Lucky you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how can we all uh, learn from each other? Uh, it may be KubeVirt learn uh, from the end users, maybe features that you want us to add, like the most exciting feature that you want us to add or some bug that like really disturbs you and you want us to prioritize. And also uh, end users uh, from end users because uh, you have a lot of a comment and uh, you can learn from each other. I uh, think I uh, heard uh, Dinesh uh, talking about uh, some collaboration uh, with NVIDIA about uh, Petro in a uh, GPU. So maybe we can start with you. <laughs> yeah, I think um Getting involved in the, the community calls, I think for me, unfortunately, most of my uh, collaboration with the community happens at KubeCon. Um, it's a really nice place for me to actually talk to people face to face and I'm not being bothered by Slack, or well, I am, but not as much as when I'm in the office and things. So Ryan and I had a really good conversation at the sh uh, Solutions Showcase. Uh, we were talking about what we're, what we're doing. So uh, at Sivo, we're looking to introduce GPUs into the virtual machines that we're offering. And you know, talking to Ryan about his experience about already doing this and running it at scale uh, was really, really valuable knowledge. And then I think some of our ideas and use cases are slightly different to yours. And being able to think about the stuff coming up in one twenty seven, you said. Yeah. So um, we we were so one of the things that um, specifically we were discussing is um, so he. he so his use case is he's got a he's got machine learning right? machine learning so workload yeah, yeah yeah and and you you're passing through GPUs to to guess yeah so so at um and and GeForce now um and Nvidia we we do um we pass through GPUs we also will provide guess vGPUs 
Um, so in, and one of the things I want to, want to recall is that at some point you may also want to pass through um, v, VGPUs or absolutely. Devices, right? So yeah, in our in our use case, we've got a data center full of some A100s, which we're really privileged to have access to and offer to, to customers. But um, not everyone needs the power of you know eight eight A100s in one go. So we're interested in can we create some VGPUs and pass that in to a VM, but only as a customer requires it. And then afterwards, we can pull that GPU out and offer it to someone else. And that's currently not possible, right? Well, so it is possible. And uh, there are some challenges, though. <laughs> and um, I can speak to them. So specifically today, um, if you want to do this, and, and is you, you'd use the device plugin framework. And, and the use case I'm, I'm talking about here is um, and what you want to think about is like, we, we want to be able to dynamically switch devices from different drivers we want to you know we want to be able to set it up for pass through we want to set it up to as a as a media device or um or whatever it is to, to set it up as a, a vgpu so different drivers for this stuff so the issue it becomes when you use the device plugin is if you can imagine um we have two users that want access to this this one physical gpu and uh, user one comes along and, and they request a, a physical gpu so we pass it through to the guest um, so for a period of time, they are using this uh, this device, and then they're finished. So at that point in time, when they're done, the next user comes along, and they request, let's say, a, a vGPU. Um, so now, what do we have to do? We have to change the configuration of the device to make it available. So that you can run into some problems here, um, because uh, as part of the device plugin framework, there's an allocate API, which is great. It gives us the ability to, to provide this device for the guest. The problem that you run into is when you want to do this dynamically is there isn't a deallocate API. So there isn't a way to say, oh, okay, we need to, at this point, the workload's done. We need to change the device to look like something else so that we can pass it through to or, or provide it as a vGPU to, for user two. And so the, this becomes a problem where you can actually, for a period of time, we actually have an, in, we have a, internally, we, call, we have a technical term for this, we call it, we call it leaking the GPU, where we, we're basically, there's a period of time where we actually lose track of the GPU because we're trying to, we're trying to switch the device driver, but we actually don't know the right time to do it. Even though we have a user asking for it, we haven't really advertised that this device is, is now available to use so we can switch it. So one of the um, one of the uh, some exciting work um, they're actually sitting right here. So our, our, some colleagues of mine, uh, Evan and Lazar and Kevin Clues, have been working on DRA and, and the community and something that we're excited about. And this is something that would allow you to actually uh, to do this dynamically. Where in in one twenty seven uh, we DRA uh, stands one, for a dynamic resource allocation. Uh, and in one twenty seven is where you'd want to look to uh, consume DRA so that you can do uh, dynamically provision and uh, allocate and deallocate these resources so you can switch the drivers and set up the devices so that you can advertise the devices correctly without having this this leak you can leak the GPUs. Yeah, and I don't think I want to lose a GPU just in case it goes walking somewhere and I never see it again. But um, yeah, I think these conversations that we're having um, at the the, the solution showcase were really really interesting for me and I learned I learned a lot from that one conversation. So the community around this project is really, really friendly. They're really, really open. And I think for me, I know I need to get more involved so I can put my feedback and almost my requests and my spin on it so that the project can be used by a large set of users. I mean, for me, all, all I can say that uh, if anyone is interested in using KubeVirt for a new project for a use case, I'm happy to talk about it, also why we decided for it or against it or compare it to other technologies out there, etc. So I'm definitely up for anyone to chat about it. No requests for us. Feature you want. Nothing annoying. <laughs> cool. <laughs> we are best. We are great. Uh, so we have just five more minutes, so I uh, think it's a good opportunity for uh, questions uh, from the audience. So if any of you have uh, any questions. Thank you. So you said you have a couple of long-running virtual machines. Can you or do you lie migrate those machines in, during maintenance? So uh, currently at the moment we have a limitation on our side that uh, live migration is not supported on our particular implementation. Um, so at the moment we cold migrate them. Um, fortunately for us, 95% um, of the workload that we run and our customers run is our Kubernetes nodes. 
Um, so we have the ability with our managed product that we're able to um, reach into the tenant API and do a graceful migration of workload before we cold migrate the, the node. Um, for VMs themselves that make up that 5% workload, they receive a graceful shutdown and a startup. Um, our kind of thought on this is it's a cloud, so we can get away with it, which is, which is very fortunate, but we're working over the next 12 months to give that live migration support. Um, it is supported in Kubevert at the moment, I think. Is that right? I yes, don't know yes, if anyone yes. is using it from the panel. Yes, it is supported, of course. We so we don't use it. Uh, we don't use live migration right now, and there's various reasons. And you can imagine. Um, I mean, if you have a hard time mi live migrating physical GPUs, and so there's a limitation there. Uh, and we also use bridge networking. Um, there are also a little bit of limitations with doing that. Is there is an ability to. So there there is actually a proposal um, to actually do this with with bridge networking, but. Um, where because we we want to maintain um, low latency, it's it's difficult for us. So we sort of live with the idea that since our workloads are short lived, so to speak, we're we're okay. You know, with that churn, we just kind of take advantage of when there's low churn. You know, we we make our nodes unschedulable, and then we do maintenance on those nodes when there's when all the workloads have been evacuated. Uh, so just wanted uh, uh, to say that uh, yes, we do support live migration, uh, but it uh, it depends. Uh, there, uh, for example, as if you use a, po a bridge networking uh, for uh, your uh, main pod networking, uh, so currently it's uh, not supported. Uh, yes, there is a, a PR uh, from the that was sent uh, from the community to maybe enable it. Uh, but if you use masquerade. Uh, you can live migrate. Uh, if you don't use uh, the pod network, just uh, secondary uh, uh, interfaces, also you should be able uh, to live migrate. Uh, hello, how do you manage the virtual machines creation? How do you actually create the virtual machines? Can you tell a little bit more about that? I mean, so in the end, um, you install the kubevirt operator in the Kubernetes cluster, and then you have custom resource definition. So you can create new resources, for example, a virtual machine instance. It's kind of like creating a pod, um, but you provide some, some other details. For example, let's just for simplicity say the, um, the path or the URL to, to a disk file for the virtual machine. And then all the magic happens in the back background and kubevirt will create a pod, a virt launcher pod in which the virtual machine runs. So and what we then simply do on Killer Coda is we simply create a Kubernetes resource. Yes, in our case we have a Golang application that uses the um, a Kubernetes client and uh, simply creates an, a resource object. Uh, yeah, very, very similar for us. So we have um, a build process where we create raw images for things like Ubuntu and Rocky, Debian, and Kubernetes distributions. Uh, we push them to an OCI registry. Sim very similar, we distribute those to all of the local computes for fast build time. And then we use um, CDI, the containerized data importer, to just create a um, new PVC and spin up a VM, we have operators that run inside our Kubernetes clusters, which respond to a custom resource to create a virtual machine. So uh, the way w way we create uh, virtual machines is we, we actually have a, I guess you call it a service or, a, or an operator, I don't know, a controller, uh, and that will be responsible for um, creating services, uh, creating the, the VMIs. And, and can, the way you can imagine this is like we have, we have different, um, loads on our system at different times. So we have this service that understands like when's the right time to like start ramping up and, you know, getting s these uh, sessions available to us. And then, you know, when's the time to sort of scale back and, and, and bring the, the load back uh, down in the cluster. So we have a, another service that handles it. It interacts directly with the API. It's an authenticated client and similar to, um, you know, what the guys were saying. Yes, maybe you can take uh, the mic. Yeah, thank you. I would like to know uh, how do you route external traffic to the virtual machines? Which solutions do you use? Uh, are they load balancer services or you use uh, layer two network? Uh, 
we use we've got overlay underlay networks we use uh, over in kubernetes for for our network and we um, will attach different um, uh, we'll attach different interfaces to our to our guests and this is how we'll, we'll like we'll you use out. kubernetes services to to attach them so yeah we use like we use like we use open kubernetes to to do this and we use network attached definitions to actually attach the yeah yeah i got it, got it so you use external uh cni plugins additional additional light through the multus yes and yes we use multus yes yeah got it uh we've we've written our own cni to create isolation and do uh, routing in from the public internet and give isolation so that's how we've done that how is your uh, CNI called? Maybe others uh, may use it. Uh, it's uh, kind of proprietary at the moment because of, of what we're doing and, and providing that isolation. So, um, yeah, happy to say it, it is a CNI. It interacts directly through the CNI interface and it um, just is very similar to any of the other ways that you, you call it. Um, but it does some obviously magic behind the scenes to give that isolation and the routing in from public networks. Uh, do you use like main CNI plugin or as additional attached through the network attachments? Uh, so it's something, it, it is a network attachment um, that we use. So okay. you don't use uh, the primary pod network at all? No, we don't use the primary pod network. Thanks. Um, yeah, for us, we use the um, default Kubernetes networking or like we have in some clusters, I think running Weave and others, uh, Calico. And um, not too much customization other than uh, isolation with, uh, for example, network policies. Thanks a lot. Do. I don't know if uh, we have more time. Uh, sorry. <laughs> We'll um, we'll stay here at the at the end if you did want to come up and ask the questions. <laughs>